Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Construction Show product promo. Today, we are featuring back on the show, we've got LP Building Solutions, and we're going to be looking at their LP Nova Core. Um, and we've got definitely got the expert in here today. He is the Building Science Manager at LP Building Solutions, Neil Friedberg. Neil, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you for having me, Jerry. What, let's let's start with then. For anybody who doesn't know, let's introduce who who is LP. Yeah, so LP is an OSB and siding manufacturer. So we make OSB. OSB is oriented strand board, and then we have the engineered wood, which is what our siding product is. Right. And all it is is basically a combination of wood flakes, resins, waxes, all pressed together. Uh, some with coating, some with paper uh, overlays, things like that. And just. For for scale, you're all across North America, Canada, um, your U.S. Canada. Uh, how far is it? Is it global? Do you distribute globally? No, not global. Uh, we call the way to South America. So we have a couple plants in South America okay. where we manufacture and sell uh, Canada and also North America, obviously. But it, not all products are everywhere. Right, and it's yeah, which is what we covered on the last episode. Um, and it's through a distribution model. So anybody as they're watching this you can find locally where to actually get the product. Yeah, correct. Okay, so the Novacore product. Let's start with what it is, and then we'll get to some of the details of it. Sure. So we took our Struck One panel, that's 7 sixteenths inch thick. Um, it comes in uh, 4 by 8 4 by 9 4 by 10 sizes. And then we partnered with Owens Corning, and we take in their XPS foam and laminated it together. Mm-hmm. So we have, um, we have different thicknesses of um, a foam providing different R values. Uh, the way we have it listed is we don't actually include the R value of the OSB. We just say an R3, which is a half inch, R5, which is a one inch, and an R7.5, which is an inch and a half foam on top of the OSB. Is there an environment where this is really good, like cold climates? Uh, is there application in like hot climates, humid climates? Where is sort of Where does it perform the best? Putting continuous insulation is benefit. It will benefit you in all areas. It may just reduce your ROI, right? So if you're looking for seven and a half in let's say Miami, you may never, you know, you may never achieve that return on investment for something that thick, but an R3 can do that faster. It's cheaper. So that way you get more benefit for that, especially in such a, you know, hot climate zone, but it's much more mild. Energy consumption really affects the, the, the states that get cold, right? So mm-hmm. that's typically what costs more. It costs way more to heat your house and to cool your house. So they tend to benefit. So the more north you are, the thicker insulation you want. So an R7.5 would be okay, an R5. I would stay away from an R3 just because of con- uh, condensation issues in such a limited amount of continuous insulation. So we just have to be wary of that um, when rec- making recommendations. But it works in all climate zones. Is this a, now a second layer of insulation? This is not replacing the other insulation that's going to go in between those studs, right? Yeah, correct. This is just an added, right? So when you're talking about continuous insulation, well, it's actually never continuous. There's gaps, there's windows, right? It's what we call it. But nonetheless, it's supposed to go over the stud. So it's like putting a jacket over your skin, right? If your skin is the bone and the meat is your insulation, that jacket is the continuous layer that you put on top of yourself. So then going back to the breathability, is that if that also depends on like humidity, the, these 16 zones you're talking about. Does that all change depending on where you are as well? Yeah, well, yeah. So, it, you know, height changes, uh, rain, um, wind-driven rain changes. Like there's a lot of um, there's a lot of aspects to like deciding what you use. But like, for example, in Seattle, if you were to use a one inch, that would be the bare minimum and probably your highest ROI. But then if you went to inch and a half, it'd be a little bit less ROI, but it's still beneficial. Right, so you 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 get less thermal reduction due to the studs, and you get the benefit of the cavity insulation that you still have to have with the continuous insulation. What are some of the common questions you're getting from? I mean, from builders, you know, people that are building more than you know a little reno that they're actually putting up maybe a multi-unit. They're they're specking this product in right from the very beginning. Do you have? Do I need to put a house wrap on it? And the answer is yes. The other big question is, is what happens with my siding? Well, the benefit of using LP sheathing, the, the Novacore sheathing with the um, smart side is we have a direct to OSB attachment. So that way, even though it's off of the studs, you can actually still penetrate the OSB and count. Of course, that distance is specified based on the weight of the material in the instructions. So that way you have that information. But that's one of the benefits of it. If you were to use like a fiber cement material, you would probably have to go to the stud 
and actually have to make sure that you're properly anchored because we are cantilevering the OSB. Right. The okay. So the OSB though, now you mentioned other products now, of course, not every time your product goes on the wall is now the siding. So then what needs to, you already kind of mentioned it, but let's clarify what needs to happen. Let's say someone's putting a vinyl up or, you know, whatever it is. Yeah, so based on the manufacturers for the vinyl or for the fiber cement, or let's say it's a cultured stone, they would provide uh, typically a nailing pattern that would be necessary. Uh, the Foam Sheathing Coalition put out a, a nailing pattern recommendation based on the thickness of foam. A lot of uh, manufacturers will reference that. It's a really good reference. The coalition did an amazing job. And that's what we recommend to look at also. Uh, that way, when you're cantilevering through foam, you understand like the weight, the PSF, because fiber cement is going to be uh, a magnitude much heavier than yeah. like OSB. And then brick is going to be a, a magnitude heavier than you know fiber cement. Where is the value, though? Again, we've talked about it, but let's circle back to it. There's a green building standard certification. There's something called LEED. I actually don't know what that is. LEED? Yeah, so so LEED is an architectural program that it helps uh, that helps in the design of the building, how, how you know, they, they equate um, distance of the material being shipped in helps with LEED. Uh, making sure you don't turn on the, air, the HVAC system in the building until all the VOCs have lifted and settled, mm. those kind of things. They're, like, they're more uh, governing standards in which you can apply and then get different levels of it. This, this is just one item that can help you. Okay. And, 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 the green, and the green guard certification is typically for like off-gassing during the manufacturing or even during the life of the product. So it's just one of those items where like in California, green guard is great. It, it, it helps with the people who are concerned about VOCs from uh, new construction. So these certifications that you're talking about, LEED um, and the, uh, the green building standards, how much opportunity does that give you then in the market? Uh, how important is that to people that are now building new homes? Sure. So LEED have their own standards, and that would benefit whomever's building to that standard, both homes and commercial buildings. Uh, the Green Guard certification allows us to uh, use our product around children, schools, and things like that, mm. specifically in California. But other things that people would do today would be like a HER score, a home energy rating um, score for your house, right? So our product would be beneficial towards that, towards the Energy Star program, if it's still around, um, or other items that benefit uh benefit the builder for uh, local energy uh, conservation programs that are sponsored by energy um, suppliers. There's, there's weatherization programs that exist for new homes to make them tighter, to make them more energy efficient because it reduces the load from that building on the grid. Do most people know of the product? Do they understand how the product worked? How is that integrated into the initial design? Is that ever a challenge or is that pretty standard procedure? No, so it, it is a challenge. So because we are cantilevering structure, so it's basically structure, foam, considerate air. It adds nothing to structure. It right. studs. Right. We actually get a reduction in some shear. So we've done our own calculations using APA to test and put up our own uh, shear tables. So a builder can go and look at our PRN number in on the website and actually download it and look at the different seismic loading that we have designed mm. and um, shear loading that we have designed. But like for our product, without a significant amount, I, I, I'm sorry, I wouldn't say significant, without extra work, we couldn't be used in high seismic and high wind areas, but moderate seismic, moderate wind areas were completely fine. And oh. then our, our, our nailing pattern changes from like the typical six, uh, six inch uh, around the perimeter, 12 in the field to three, 12 or four, 12. So four around the perimeter or three around the perimeter and 12 in the field. Right. So that's all spec'd out. That could all be sent to your engineer, your designer, and they can put that, that all in. Correct. They can add it to their equations and then model it out. So the insulation in the cavity isn't continuous, right? Um, what we've, well, in the industry for the longest time, we've used about a 25% framing factor. So we take that in a two by four wall, we take um, that R13 bat or R15 bat and reduce it 25%. And that's technically considered your relative effective R value in that cavity space. I'm excluding the different layers because that changes the value a little bit. So right there, I'm losing about 25%, but the real framing factor tends to be closer to 30. So now I'm taking that 15 and reducing a 30%. Or if I'm using a two by six wall, like in Colorado, I'm taking that uh, 21 or 20 and reducing it or 19 and reducing it 30%, right? So all of a sudden, am I getting that R19 benefit in that cavity? No, you're so you're losing. You're, you're talking about like the, the studs themselves, windows, all that. That is all space that is now not being insulated. Is that what we're talking Correct. about? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, 
you know, there's some insulation because there's thermal resistance in all products, but nonetheless, it's not equivalent to like your cavity. Right. Um, and then that that continuous insulation just adds to it, right? So even though I've taken that 30% reduction in R value of 19, I'm actually, and that ends up being, let's say like an R12. Well, now I put an R5 continuous insulation around the perimeter and all of a sudden my R12 wall becomes an R17 wall. Right. So I'm actually gaining a lot. Mm. And in codes, we actually take account for that. Right. We reduce that. We know what we understand that putting in this bat is going to be a framing factor. So even though we ask for more insulation, we understand that the effective insulation is a lot less. Would it be fair to say then that the value of the product goes up as the temperature drops? Is that sort of a, a fair assessment? Yeah, so that's actually true for 99% of construction materials. So as the temperature goes down, your the R value actually increases. Um, except for most of the polyisos that exist today, they have a blowing agent that condenses. So that's typically what we're compared to. XPS is typically compared to polyiso because polyiso has an R a higher R value um, per inch at room at uh, 75, 55, which is what we test at. Um, but as the temperature gets colder that polyiso tends to lose res, uh, resistance um, because of that blowing agent going from a gaseous state to a liquid state. And then XPS does not see that. So we actually get a higher R value and a significant one. So something at like 55 degrees uh, in temperature, polyiso significantly loses, especially with that one specific blowing agent, loses a significant amount of its R value. How does it perform in the reverse when the heat comes? Especially like dry, like that dry kind of heat you'll see in some areas. True. So you'll get, you will get a mild decrease, but that is uniformly across all materials again. Um, But nonetheless, you know, it's, it's much more about keeping heat out or keeping heat in. Right. So it goes both ways. Yeah. Yeah. So because of the, you know, physics high to low always. Right. So when it's cold outside, all that heat wants to escape out. Mm -hmm. And when it's um, hot outside, how that heat wants to come in. And your HVAC system is pulling it out, right? So that's basically what's happening, and that's what we're doing. We're just controlling that heat transfer in that wall. And in my opinion, this is probably the biggest bang for your buck anyways, because if you're looking at a home or looking at retrofitting a home in the future, no one sits there and goes, hey, I'm going to tear down my wall and add continuous insulation. They're going to say, hey, I want new countertops. Hey, I want new tile. And they never open up their wall. I'm a big fan of what we call right-sizing an HVAC system. So when people are installing HVAC systems, specifically new homes, retrofits a little bit harder because you may not be able to air seal or add insulation. But if you're looking at a new home and you're adding that continuous insulation, you get to reduce some of that tonnage, which causes the benefit to the initial cost. And then if you actually right size it, most HVAC systems are designed to run all day. They actually don't like turning off. They only turn off is when they hit that set point of temperature. Yeah. But like in a humid climate, that may be bad. They may turn off and there's a bunch of humidity still in there. So you're very oh. uncomfortable and you tend to lower the air to reduce that humidity to become more comfortable. In like a dry air climate, you can actually have it much warmer and still be very comfortable mm. because of the lack of humidity or the lack of latent load, um, which allows the, the, the occupant to benefit from that. So that R value increase reduces tonnage, which re- perf- uh, increases performance potentially if right size. Thank you for coming on, Neil. It's, it's been lots of fun. I, I wish we could kind of keep talking and going to case. I mean, there's all sorts of things we could do, but um, I, hopefully this is enough to kind of give the audience an understanding of what the product is and where it's applicable. Thank you for having me on your show. And if people want to look up more information, always go to lpcorp.com to find all your information on our products. I, I do have a LinkedIn and I also have a BS with Neil for building science with Neil on Instagram. Okay, great. We'll, we'll link that too. We'll have all that in the description. And thank you everybody for watching the construction show product promo. We've got more coming to you. So make sure to hit subscribe and follow us on LinkedIn or social media, other social media platforms. You see us. Thank you for watching. We'll see you on the next episode of the Construction Show product promos.